Hello guys, welcome back to this CCNA video series. In this video, we're going to have a detailed look at the STP root bridge election process. So in the previous video, I talked about the reasons why we need STP. We also had a brief overview look at the STP um, root bridge election process. So I s told you guys that the way STP works is that we elect one bridge to be our main switch. The other switches then choose their quickest paths to reach that main switch and then block everything else. However, obviously the process is a bit more detailed than that. Um, so the objectives for this video are to understand the STP root bridge election process, the different port roles that we have, what, what a BPDU is, and essentially just at the end of this video, you guys should be able to then go and explain the STP process, election process in detail to somebody else. So to begin with the root bridge. So the way that the STP process works is first we have to elect one switch to be the main switch in our network now this is called the root bridge and so the way it works all the switches they will speak to each other and they will engage in a election essentially that election will say which switch should be the root bridge which switch should be the main switch in our network they all talk to each other and in the end they decide on which switch is going to be the root bridge now think about this logically we as network engineers we want to have a way that we can dictate who is going to be the root bridge in our network the reason being because that root bridge is going to be the center of our network meaning all traffic is going to pass through that root bridge if all traffic is going to pass through that root bridge we just don't want any switch becoming the root bridge we want to be able to control who can become the root bridge and essentially choose the strongest most powerful switch in our network and so this election process even though it's kind of like they will speak to each other we can actually rig and influence the election process by changing some stp configuration on one of the switches so that we can ensure one switch and one switch only becomes that root bridge now let's have a look at the root bridge election process so how is the root bridge elected so before we talk about that we need to understand that switches all send something called a bpdu which stands for bridge protocol data unit and so what a bpdu is it's a frame which just contains information about the sdp topology that's literally all it is and it's used for two things it's used for the root bridge election it's also used for like topology changes but most importantly it was also used for picking up loops so the way that it works if this switch down here were to send a bpdu and if it were to receive that same bpdu they sent out this link on this link it knows that a loop exists because he's thinking wait a minute i sent a bpdu at this link i received an exact same bpd by this link the only way that that could have happened is if that bpd was able to loop around and get back to me meaning that, that there's a loop in the network meaning that we need stp to essentially block one of those redundant links and so the way that the election process works uh, is that at the beginning the switches will all believe that they should be the root bridge after a while they will well, after a few seconds they will then decide on one switch who's going to be the root bridge so the bpdu there are three types of bpdus there's the configuration bpd which lists information about the stp topology and is used for the election process then we have the topology change notification or tcn bpdu the way that this works as an as an example imagine that this this switch detects a link failure so imagine this link goes down this switch will send a topology change notification bpdu over to this guy just essentially letting him know that something's changed in the stp topology i experienced a change in the stp topology so i'm letting you know that guy will then send back a topology change acknowledgement or tca bpdu telling this guy okay i have so me i have received your tcn bpdu you don't have to send that to me again I have acknowledged that I've received that. I know that there's been a topology change. I want to turn around and let my neighbors know that there's been a topology change. Now, we, we will look at how STP handles topology changes in another video because it's, it's very important because obviously if something changes in the STP topology, i.e. I, we get a new root bridge or a link goes down, STP has to be able to react to that change in a timely manner and notify all the other switches that something has changed. It's important to understand that each time a switch propagates a, P a BPDU, it will change the, it will change the sender 
bridge ID field, more about that in a second. And BPDUs, they're sent to the multicost MAC address of 0180C2000000. So if we ever see a frame via a Wireshark capture with that destination MAC address, chances are that frame is going to be for a BPDU and we'll be carrying SDP information about the topology. Maybe a topology change or something like that. So how is this root bridge? So this root bridge, this main switch, how was it elected? Okay, how do the switches def decide who should be the root bridge? So each switch with STP is assigned a bridge ID that's made up of a 16-bit bridge priority and a 48-bit MAC address. Now the bridge priority is a 16-bit arbitrary number and it's assigned to a switch for the X uh, for the STP election process it's a multiple of 4096 and the default priority so every switch out the box every Cisco switch will have a default bridge priority of 30 32,768 and so the way that the election process works the switch was the lowest bridge priority that will be elected as the root bridge if we have two switches with the same bridge priority, then that means that the switch with the lowest MAC address will be elected as the root bridge. Now, we want to be able to dictate via bridge priority one switch to become the root bridge. The reason being, because if we leave it to the tiebreaker, which is the MAC address, that means that the switch was the lowest MAC address, and usually, old switches will have a lower MAC address, will be elected as the root bridge, meaning an old weak switch would be elected over a newer, stronger switch. And so, for a second, let's just think back and let's think logically why we would need to have a bridge priority. So, we want to be able to influence which switch is elected as the root bridge. Okay, we can't change the MAC address because the MAC address is burned into the device. Okay, then let's use a arbitrary number which we can change. And so that's why we have the bridge priority because what the bridge priority allows us to do, allows us to change some value on the switch so that when the switch does send BPDUs and the other switch receives those BPDUs, those switches will believe that that one switch should be the root bridge. So the bridge priority gives us some sort of arbitrary value which we can configure on our switches to influence the outcome of this election process. Hence the reason why we have a bridge priority. And hence the reason why that bridge priority makes up the bridge ID. So the way that this election process works, okay, is all switches at the beginning of the process they will believe that they should be the root bridge. Essentially, they don't know anything else about the STP topology. They're like, hmm, I haven't received any other BPDUs. I should be the root bridge. Okay. And so the way that, th that this works. So let's take this case as an example. Okay. This switch will send a BPDU. It's going to have the sender bridge ID of itself. So as I said before, the bridge ID is made up of the bridge priority, in this, in this case 600. So this is just an example. Obviously, the bridge priority in real life would have to be a multiple of 4096. However, it's easier if we just use smaller numbers. So it will send a BPDU and we'll list obviously its bridge priority. And we'll list its 48 bit MAC address. Now, I'm not going to include the whole MAC address in this scenario or in this example just to make it easier and to make the, the diagram cleaner and easier to understand. But in this case, let's say this example. So he sends this, this configuration BPDU, is sent from himself and is listing himself as the root bridge. So the two most important fields in the in the BPDU will be the sender bridge ID, who sent this BPDU, and the root bridge ID, who this switch believes is the root bridge. Okay, or, or who is the root bridge for this STP topology. In this case, this switch is going to receive that BPDU and it's going to be like, wait a minute, this is an inferior BPDU. This guy who sent this configuration BPDU to me, he's listing a switch, okay, he's listing a switch as the root bridge, which has a lower bridge ID than me, which has a lower bridge priority. I actually have a better chance of becoming the, the root bridge because I have a lower bridge priority. So I should be the root bridge. So in this case, what does this guy appear to do? 001, he sends back a configuration BPDU list, uh, obviously sent from himself, but listing himself as the root bridge. In this case, 002 is going to receive that bridge PDU. It's going to confer, um, compare its bridge ID to the bridge ID listed as the root bridge. And essentially figure out, wait a minute, this guy who sent this BPDU, he's listing himself as the root bridge, and that and that root bridge has a lower bridge priority than myself, meaning that guy should be the root bridge. 
So now I'm going to stop advertising myself as the root bridge. I'm going to throw my support behind this guy and basically say to everybody, wait a minute, this guy, he is the guy who should be the root bridge. We should all elect him. And I firmly believe that he's a strong candidate to become the root bridge. This guy will then propagate. He's going to take that BPDU that he received. It will change the sender bridge ID field to 600002. Leave the root bridge as 200001 and propagate this BPDU over to this guy. And to be fair, this guy's going to go through the exact same process. He's going to look at it and say, okay, I have a bridge ID of 500003. This guy, 600002, is listing a root bridge of 200001. The root bridge that he's listing, 001, should actually be the root bridge. The reason being because he is the best candidate. He has the lowest bridge ID, lowest, lowest bridge priority. So now in the end, at the end of this election process, all switches believe that 001 should be the root bridge because it has the lowest bridge priority, lowest bridge ID. And so now all switches, they all agree. And this is where our election kind of like... Um, analogy ends because they now they, they actually all agree that this guy should be the root bridge there's no qualms about it there's no discussion about it they believe that he should be the root bridge and this process takes a few seconds and so the way that it works now is that so before we decided on who was going to be the root bridge okay so before this happened every device every switch sorry would be generating and sending its own bpdus now that the root bridge is elected only the root bridge generate BPDUs. So he will be generating the, B, the the BPDU and sending it down here and down here. Now the reason this is done is because this helps out with the rest of the STP topology building process. So we've so essentially we've decided on the root bridge. Now we have to decide on everything else. And, and by having the root bridge generate the BPDUs, this helps out with this process. And so he will generate the, the these configuration BPDUs. All these switches, so all 002 and 003D. When they receive that BPD, they will change the sender bridge ID field as well as a few other fields, and they will just propagate that BPD out to its neighbors. And essentially what that essentially says is that I send this BPD, but I believe that this other switch should be the root bridge. So essentially it's it's saying I sent it. However, I believe somebody else is a root bridge. Okay, and that and that's what we all see. We will see that these guys will be propagating that BPD and and, and that guy as well, etc. But now, so far, we have our root bridge. So we know who is a center point in our network. And in this case, like I said before, the reason why we have the bridge priority, it gives us some value to manipulate so that we can dictate who will be the root bridge. Again, we can't change MAC addresses, but we can change some sort of arbitrary value. Now, we have one switch elected as the root bridge. And obviously, being the root bridge, you have to get some sort of re reward um for being the root bridge so he has to be handed something so i have the root bridge I, ha I i have to get something for it and so the reward that this switch gets 001 he gets all of its ports to be put into the designated port role and put into the forwarding state all a designated port is it's a port in the stp topology which is in a forwarding state and that would make sense because if you think about it if your root bridge is going to be the center point in your network. It will need to be forwarding all traffic in your LAN, meaning all of its ports should be capable of forwarding traffic. Hence the reason why all of its ports get be get get put into the designated port role and are therefore forwarding ports in the forwarding state. So now, just to recap again, I know I keep, re I know I keep going over this, but we have the root bridge. It is this guy up here, and he has designated ports. Now, what about these guys? What is the next process? So that's the the second leg, or the second step in this in this STP process. So we've chosen the root bridge. That's good. Now, to build the STP topology, and essentially we have to build the STP topology to find out which links should be falling and which links should be blocked. The switches will now work out their fastest path or the lowest cost path, as they, as they like to call it, to reach the root bridge. Because obviously, this guy's got the, got has got two routes. This guy's got two routes. He needs to know, out of these two routes, which is my best path to reach this guy? And he needs to know, out of my two routes, what is my path, or my best path, to reach this guy over here? Now, the fastest route to the root bridge is called the root path. Okay? And it's based on the cumulative STP cost of all links in that route. 
Now, what does that mean? What's STP cost? How has that worked out, etc. So let's let's dive a bit deeper into this. So, the way that STP works is STP assigns a default cost value to all of our interfaces depending on their speed. So, as an as an example, a link running at 10 meg will be assigned an STP cost of 100. A link running at 100 meg will be assigned an STP cost of 19. A link running at 1 gig would be assigned an STP cost of 4. A link running at 10 gig would be assigned an STP cost of 2. And so the way that it works, each switch, from its local perspective, will add up the STP cost of each outgoing interface for each path. So as an example, imagine I want to use this path over here. The 002 will add the STP cost of each outgoing link in that path. So that means, so to reach the root bridge using this path, I have to exit this interface and this interface. So I will add the STP cost of this interface and this interface to work out the overall STP cost via this path. To reach the root bridge over this path, I only have to exit out my local interface. So I will work, so I will then work out or add that cost and work out the STP or the overall cost to reach the root bridge out of this interface. It's literally as simple as that. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. Okay, let's say that I choose this guy or this port as being the best path. What is that port called? And that port is called the root port. So the root port is the lowest or is the interface, which is part of the lowest cost path to reach that root bridge. So essentially what the root port is, is saying that I have to leave this interface or this interface presents to me the quickest path to reach my root bridge. Now the rules to select the root port are as follows. We have lowest STP path cost, which is what we just discussed. However, imagine as an example, imagine that this guy is path or is the STP cost to reach this guy over here. Sorry, the STP cost to reach the root bridge via this path and this path are the same. What does it do then? It then picks the lowest neighbor bridge ID. So he knows, okay, this neighbor has a bridge ID 200001. This guy has the bridge ID 500003. I'm going to pick this path because this path, the the neighboring switch over this path has got a lower a lower bridge ID than over this path. And with that ties, then we pick lower lowest neighbor port priority and then lowest numbered physical port on the neighbor switch. Now these two tiebreakers we'll discuss in the next video because they are for a specific scenario. I don't think that we will I don't think in a network you would ever see that scenario. Um because we would use something like Ether Channel in that sort of scenario. But again it's always good to know because it's good it's always good to understand. So calculating the root port. So in this example, 002, that has got two paths to reach the root bridge. Okay, it's got this path over here via this link and this path over here via this link. So it has a direct path over a 100 megabit link and a indirect path over a one gig link. So the way that this works out, okay, switch 002 knows I've got two paths to reach the root bridge. And like I said again, it only considers the outgoing interfaces. That means, let's say this interface so STP cost, we can actually change. Imagine we changed this interface to have an STP cost of 20. Would that affect the root boot selection process? No, it wouldn't. The reason being, because this guy only considers the outgoing interfaces in that path. That means if we wanted to influence the selection, we would have to change this interface to a different STP cost so that it would prefer this link. Or we can change this, this interface on the local switch to have a lower STP cost so that it chooses that link. So STP cost we can actually control. However, we, we would rather use the default values. So the way that this works is he looks at each path and realizes, okay, I've got a direct path with a STP cost of 19. I have an indirect path, so I have to exit this interface and this interface with a STP cost of A. I'm going to choose the indirect path because it has the lowest cumulative STP cost to reach there. I'm going to set this port as the root port because this this port is part of the lowest cost path to my root. It is the port that I can use to reach the root bridge the quickest. And so it chooses this port as its root port. And so essentially that's how the root port is calculated. Now, if we were going to go for 003, it's going to do the exact same thing. It's going to realize, okay, I've got two paths to reach the root bridge. One via this link with a cost of four. One via this link with a cost of four plus 19, which is 23. I choose this path because it is 
it has a lower cost. And I will put this port as my root port, because this port presents to me the lowest cost path, or with this port presents to me a chance to use the lowest cost path to reach the root bridge. It's literally as simple as that. So if we were using a network topology diagram, that's how we would calculate it. But now, let's look at this. How would the switch work that out? Because obviously, how does this guy know that this port has an STP cost of four? How, think about that logically, how would it even know? Because it doesn't have a direct link to that port. Um, so how would it know that, it can, that that has a cost of four? And obviously we have to consider all links in the past because obviously this is just a small topology. But imagine that this, so imagine that the local switch only considered its local ports when choosing the root port. Imagine that this link was actually a 100 meg link, sorry, a 10 meg link with an STP cost of uh, 100. That would mean that this path wouldn't be the best. Now, if we only considered the local interfaces, this path would still be selected because obviously 4 is less than 19. But in reality, this path would be quicker because it has a lower STP cost. That's, that's the reason why when we're calculating the root port, we have to consider all the links in that path, the speed of all the outgoing interfaces or all the outgoing links in that path. So now, how does a switch calculate its best path? Because obviously it doesn't know that 003's outgoing interface has an STP cost of 4. 003 has to tell it that. And this is where the bridge protocol data unit comes in. So like I said before, the BPDU is now only generated and sent um, by the root bridge. And so the way that it works um, is that the receiving switches will propagate the BPDU by just changing a few fields. Now, one of the fields is actually called the root cost um, field or the root path cost or something like that. And so that field will dictate whoever, so whoever sent that BPDU, that field will dictate their cost to reach the root bridge. Now, obviously, when the root bridge sends that BPDU, it's also going to list that field with a value of zero because he is the root bridge. It doesn't cost him anything to reach that, to reach himself, basically. And so the way that it works, when a switch receives a BPDU and then propagates it, it will add its STP cost or its root path cost or whatever you, you want to call it, but it will add its cost to reach the root bridge. And so let's see an example of this as an example. 001, he's generating a BPDU. This again, this is these are all configuration BPDUs, okay? So that's used for the election process and to tell us information about the STP topology. Now this BPDU is received by 002 and 003. So in this case, 003, he's already worked out, let's say in this example, he's already worked out his lowest cost path to reach the root bridge, and that is via this interface here. It puts that interface as the root port, because that interface is part of the lowest cost path to reach the root bridge. In this case, its cost to reach the root bridge is 4. Now, when 003 forwards, or essentially propagates the BPDU it received from the root bridge to 002. It's gonna send it's gonna change the sender bridge ID and obviously it's gonna leave the root bridge ID the same because essentially what it's telling, so essentially what that what what that tells this guy is that you can reach the root the, the root bridge through me or you can reach the root bridge directly. Essentially that's why the sender bridge that's why the bridge ID stays the same because the, the, the sender bridge ID changes to know that there's another path to the root bridge through another switch. But the root bridge ID is always the same to know that there is still a path to the root bridge and that the root bridge ha hasn't changed. So he's going to set the cost of four of that, of the, um, of the BPDU, the root path costs. And so he sends it over to him. So that's how switches know uh, the, um, the STP cost of the other links. It's because when they propagate this BPDU over, they will include what their STP cost is. So literally all 002 does. He's like, okay, I've got two paths to reach the root bridge, okay? This, di this direct path, let me work this out. So I received a BPDU with a cost of zero. I'm now going to add the STP cost of the interface I received this, this BPDU on to that cost, which gives me an overall root path cost of 19. I've also got a path via this um, interface. So now to work out the root path cost over this interface, I will add the cost in the BPD, which is four, to the cost of the incoming interface, which is four, which gives me an overall root path cost of eight. So I've got two paths to reach the root bridge, or two routes to reach the root bridge, a direct link and an indirect path. I'm gonna choose the indirect path. The reason being, because the overall cost 
of that path is eight. That means I have to go uh, via one link which 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 has a cost of four via another link which 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 has a cost of four. The direct link, even though it's a direct link, because it's running slower, it has a higher STP cost, meaning it's the worst path to reach the real bridge. Now I'm going to choose the path via 003 as my best path to reach the root bridge and i'm going to set this port to my root port so in this case the interface which is part of the lowest cost pass to reach the root bridge like i said before is the root port and it's awarded the role of the root port and it's put into the forwarding state so now this port is going to be able to send and receive traffic and learn mac addresses via that port okay so as a recap we've elected the root bridge we've chosen um, our quickest path to the root bridge and that is the root port again the root port is the interface which is part of that lowest cost path to reach the root bridge and we've seen how that's being how that's calculated by the switches so with stp the switches will actually use the bpdu this is why it's so important that we have a bpd because it tells us the stp topology but it's used to actually build this stp topology as well so that all the stp topology is is the root bridge what links are forwarding and what links are blocking now STP, the STP process dictates that we have to choose a designated port for each link. Okay, and that all a designated port is, it's a forwarding port. And each link needs to have it. And the reason why each link needs to have it is because it, it helps with two things. It helps with stopping loops. I'll discuss that in a second. It also means that we can forward traffic over that link. And that would make sense. So as an example, if this guy is a root port, that means that this guy has to be the, the designated port because it has to be one designated port per LAN segment. If this guy's a root port over here, that means 003 has to be a designated port on this segment because there has to be one per segment, per LAN segment. So in this case, this is one LAN segment, this is another LAN segment, this is another LAN segment. Per LAN segment or per link, there has to be one designated port. Okay? So as you can see, it's in the forwarding state, and it, like I said, each link must have a designated port, and there can only be one. And if one side is the designated port, the other side has to be in, an, in another port state. So uh, as you can see, he, the root bridge on this link is the designated port. That means 003 cannot be. He has to his his port has to be in another port role. Either in this case, it's going to be a a a root port. There is another port role which we will discuss later in a second. Okay, so this is the next stage of the STP process. To build the STP topology, let me select my designated ports. Now, to calculate the designated port, this is what occurs. The switch with the lowest root cost will be awarded the designated port on that last segment. The switch was the lowest bridge ID, lowest priority, or switch port was the lowest number. So switch port was the lowest priority, or switch port was the lowest number. Now, these three are, are, are tiebreakers, okay? So in this case, Let's look at this link down here. The way that this works is that 002 and 003, they will actually send and receive BPDUs. And in those BPDUs, 002 will list its cost to reach the root bridge, and 003 will list its root cost to reach the root bridge. In this case, 003 wins that, essentially wins that kind of like designated port election let's 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 say that this is the mini election taking place and because of that he gets the designated port on this land segment the reason being because his cost to reach the root bridge is four whereas 002's cost is eight meaning that four trumps eight 003 gets the designated port and gets the four traffic on that segment and to be fair we would expect that because obviously there's no point of this link or essentially 002 having this port as the root port if 003 is going to accept and forward frames over this port. That wouldn't make any sense. If this port was in the blocking state, then that means that we'd have a, a black hole because this guy would be sending receiving traffic over this link and this guy would be just dropping it and not processing it. So we, we can see why that makes sense. And as, as we can see, over this link, we already have our designated port and our root port. Over this link, we already have our designated port. Now, let's say that they both had the same STP cost to reach the root bridge. The next thing that we that we would look at is going to be the bridge id so in this case 003 would still actually get the designated port the reason being because it had a lower bridge id a lower bridge priority than this guy so the bridge id bridge priority and mac address will be used as the tiebreaker in this case so that's fine that's that's all done now what happens to this last link so as as a recap we've 
got the root bridge. We've chosen our root ports, the fastest path to reach that root bridge. We've chosen our designated ports on each last segment. In this case, we only had to do it for this segment, the reason being because we already had a DP there and a DP there. We've chosen our root ports and we have another DP here. Okay, now what about this segment over here? This link. So the link between 001 and 002. Well, this link already has a designated port. Okay, and okay, so that's fine. So we've already got that. Now 002 already has a root port, which means that this cannot be a root port because there can only be one root port per switch. So what happens to this port here? It becomes a non-designated port, meaning 002 puts this port into the blocking state. That means that it's not going to process any traffic received in this link, learn any MAC addresses, etc. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. Abdur, why? So, I don't understand this, Abdur. So, okay, the, that's blocking. I know that. Blocking traffic. But why is this falling traffic? That doesn't make any sense. That just seems like wasting bandwidth or and that seems unnecessary. Well, think about it like this. If you go back to what I said originally at the beginning of this video, the BPDU, the Bridge Protocol Data Unit, that is used to, that is used to detect loops. So think of it like this. If 002 receives a BPDU listing the same root bridge, so in this case, it's going to receive a BPDU from 003 and 001. They're both going to be listing 001 as a root bridge. He knows I've got two paths to reach the root bridge, meaning that there's still a loop in my network, meaning I still have to keep this interface blocked. If this interface were to cease receiving BPDUs, that means that 002 will take this port out of the blocking state, move it to a designated port, and start forwarding traffic causing a loop. That is the reason why what you'll often see is that for most designated, so for most link segments, you will always see a, des a designated port, and if it's not a root port, you'll always see the other side be a non-designated port and be in the blocking state. The reason being is because this switch down here still needs to receive BPDUs, so remember, a port in the blocking state doesn't send BPDUs. Only a designated port sends BPDUs. Or a port in the forwarding state, like a root port, sends and receives B BPDUs. So because of that, uh, this still allows 002 to understand that there's a second route a second path to reach the root bridge, and it allows it to make understand that because of the second path, there's a loop, I have to keep this into the blocking state. So now, the way that the BPD is afforded, so, so 001 will essentially generate the BPD, send it down here, down here, 003 will then just forward it over to here. 002, again, we'll look um, when we do our labs. I don't know if this is true or not, but I think once the STP topology settles, and it's, in this case, this is going to be the final STP topology, so we'll be forwarding over the these links and 002 will be blocking over this link i think that once the final stp topology sits down i don't think that the root ports actually forward bpdus or, or send bpdus i think that it, it, it will only send and receive traffic and so now let's have a look at the bpdu fields okay so bpd fields okay protocol identify identify this is this stp frame okay Protocol version 0, which is spanning tree. This is a configuration BPDU. We have the BPDU flags field. As you can see, we have the root identifier. The root identifier identifies who is the root bridge in this STP topology or who the sender of this BPDU believes is the root bridge. Then we have the root path cost, in this case, is 0. So we know that this BPDU was sent by the root bridge. And we can tell, so there's two ways we can tell this. Because the root path cost is 0, but also because the bridge ID and the root ID are the same. So because they're the same, it, this is generated from a switch that believes it's the root bridge. We have port identifier, message age, max age, hello time, and forward delay time. So hello time just dictates how often BPDUs are sent. So BPDUs will be sent every two seconds. In this case, a configuration BPDU will be sent every two seconds. The reason being is just so that the switches know that A, the root bridge is still alive, and B, there is a and B, that path to the, to the root bridge is still a valid path. Because obviously, if something changes, we, we, we want to be able to react to that very, very quickly, not after a minute or two minutes. We want to be able to react to that within seconds. And that's all there is to it. That's STP explained. So we've looked at the root bridge election process. We've seen how STP, as a recap, elects a root bridge. More than that is done. Then we choose our root ports, which are the quickest 
path to the root bridge, the ports which are part of the quickest path to the root bridge. We then select our designated ports per LAN segment because we have to have one and essentially those designated ports are going to be forwarding not only traffic alone in MAC addresses but also forwarding VPDUs. And then we look to how we block and then we look to how we can block links. So the way that it works, we don't actually block the link itself. The port which should be put into the blocker state will be blocked. The reason being, if I go back to my example over here, is in this case, this link would be considered a blocking link because this switch over here, it will not process any traffic received apart from the BPDs. And the reason why we do this is because it allows 002 to still understand that there's an alternate path to the root bridge and to never unblock this while this path is still active because he's receiving BPDUs listing 001 as the root bridge via two links, meaning there's two ways to reach that root bridge and this and this stops a loop. So if you found this content useful, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you found this this, this video useful, uh, then please share so that we can get high quality IT training to the masses free of charge. Thank you very much for watching and please tune in next time where we will look at STP port roles, port states and how the STP topology reacts to topology changes. Thank you very much.